Hey everybody, uh, welcome back for a continuation of the Golden Age of SF. This is part two of the lectures on the Golden Age of SF. I hope everybody is doing well, that you're staying healthy, your families are well. Um, and uh, as we continue forward with the semester, uh, as I've said before, you know, keep me in the loop if, if something does risk derailing your success in the class. Um, you know, there's certainly ways that we can try to work around um, problems or I can try to put you in touch with folks that can help. And also just want to remind you that with distance learning, uh, as with any type of online education, it requires uh, a large amount of self-discipline on your part. Uh, you have to keep in mind that when you're watching these lectures, listening to these lectures, you need to have your notebook out, pen in hand, uh, so that you can make notes based on what you hear because um, you still need to be keeping a notebook for the class uh, on the lectures as well as on your readings. Uh, don't forget to do these things because part of the outcomes of the class is to improve uh, your ability as a note taker, as a writer, as someone who can pay attention to details and be able to act on those details or to um, uh, communicate those things that you've learned uh, to others uh, through summaries such as the exercises that you have after our lectures and the readings each week. Uh, so use this as an opportunity to build these skills because these are not things that you can do uh, through any tips or tricks that I can give you. It's something that you have to knuckle down and, and work on um, largely on an individual basis. That was my experience whenever I was an undergraduate. Um, though obviously we have uh, new challenges that we're having to face now uh, that I didn't have to deal with you know, whenever um, uh, I was an undergraduate. And certainly those are things that I take into account. Um, but nevertheless, you still need to give this as much energy and effort as you can, uh, not only in terms of the following the lectures, making notes, doing the readings, uh, but remember each week, after our lecture and readings, there's the uh, summary comment that's due on OpenLab. You need to keep up with your notebooks. And as I'll detail in a second lecture, uh, which was originally planned for next week, but I'm going to go ahead and record it today and post it alongside this one, um, which is doing your research for your research essay project. I want to give you as much time to be working on that as possible, so I wanted to talk about how you can use some of the library's online resources for that. Uh, but that will be in a separate video. Uh, so let's go ahead and take it off with the Golden Age of SF Part 2. Uh, so to start off, um, we have Robert A. Heinlein. Make sure you get down his name, R-O-B-E-R-T. Middle initial A, which stands for Anson, but uh, normally you know, the way that uh, his work is signed is Robert A. Heinlein, H-E-I-N-L-E-I-N, -E -E Robert A. Heinlein. And he was born in 1907 and passed away in 1988. A little bit about him is that he was educated at the University of Missouri and the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. He served as a naval officer for five years before being discharged after a lengthy hospital stay from tuberculosis. He then studied physics at UCLA for a time before beginning to publish science fiction in 1939 in John W. Campbell Jr.'s Astounding. So you can see how these writers kind of came into the orbit around astounding and John W. Campbell Jr. who we talked about in our last lecture. Robert A. Heinlein was the first Grand Master of the Science Fiction Writers of America, SFWA. He won four Hugo Awards for Best Novel. So I mean he was very well recognized uh, for uh, his writing. Next to Campbell's editing, Heinlein's influence on the development of the science fiction genre as a writer was equally significant. These are the six main characteristics of his work that I want you to know about. They're up here on the screen, and I'll go through them one by one. So first, uh, there's this idea called future history. Campbell published Heinlein's schematic for his future history in 1941 in Astounding Science Fiction. 
This future history set out diagrammatically, meaning like in a diagram, the stories that Heinlein had thus far produced, those he was to write, and some left unwritten. Heinlein's approach was an entirely new idea about storytelling that let readers understand the bigger picture of the writer's intended trajectory. It helped create a privileged and loyal group of readers. Now, Heinlein largely abandoned his future history by 1950, um, but nevertheless, there's this idea of mapping out what is yet to come in the stories. And I think that we begin seeing, uh, you know, in writing, uh, this approach to storytelling where you have like a large arc that's spread across many stories, many novels. Uh, but it's also what gave uh, some of the, the best uh, science fiction uh, storytelling on television to come in later years, such as with Babylon 5, uh, then with the uh, reimagined Battlestar Galactica. Second uh, characteristic for uh, Heinlein is hard science fiction. While Heinlein is artful about blending science into the narrative, he devoted a great deal of energy and thought into using sound scientific and engineering principles in his stories. Now, what is this idea of hard science fiction? Uh, one definition we can use is by Alan Steele in the New York Review of Science Fiction from 1992. Uh, Alan Steele defined it as, quote, Hard SF is the form of imaginative literature that uses either established or carefully extrapolated science as its backbone. And point in fact, very few stories actually pass muster as true hard SF. Uh, but we're going to talk more about hard SF in just a moment when we get uh, to Tom Godwin. Third characteristic. Heinlein had a self-assured writing style. Heinlein blended slang, aphorisms, technical jargon, clever understatement, apparent casualness, a concentration on people rather than gadgets, and a sense that the world described was real. For example, in his 1942 novel, Beyond This Horizon, Heinlein writes, quote, the door dilated, unquote, and just moves on. He doesn't stop to explain why or how. He leaves the cognitive work up to the reader. And if you can think about this, the door dilated. You think of like your eye dilates, like just to let light in or to restrict light coming in uh, to your eye. You can think of like um, the light aperture on a camera. It dilates. It opens and closes to allow more or less light in. And in 1942, imagine reading about a door dilating. When we think of doors as being hinged, you know, they open and close on that hinge. Uh, there wasn't such thing as a door dilating. Um, it, and this is something that we see later in like, you know, science fiction film. Uh, but Heinlein just jumps right into it and describes it in this very elegant, straightforward way in his writing. And he doesn't spend a lot of time, as I explained before, with Hugo Gernsback, who would spend pages explaining his inventions uh, and getting the reader slogged down in how something might actually work. Heinlein, uh, he essentially assumes that his readers are smart enough to figure it out. Another aspect of this uh, comes to us actually in the story that you read for today's class, which we'll talk more about in a minute. In All You Zombies, um, Heinlein just assim essentially assumes that we would know like how a time machine works. So unlike Wells, H.G. Wells, who spent a whole chapter of the time machine explaining how his time machine works, Heinlein knows that he does not need to do this. If he had, his readers would have been bored because they already know what a time machine was from other science fiction stories. What had happened is that the concept of the time machine had entered into what uh, the scholar Damien Broderick
B-R-O-D-E-R-I-C-K, Damien Broderick calls the science fiction megatext. The megatext is the shared terms, ideas, and concepts that constitute a genre, such as science fiction. The Western or detective megatext will each be different than the megatext for science fiction, for example. A fourth characteristic of Robert Heinlein's work is didactic father figures. Didactic father figures. These can be surrogate father figures or fathers in disguise who serve as the voice of Heinlein in the story. Didactic means to teach. Uh, so it's, uh, in a sense, a father figure who teaches or who guides. Fifth, char fifth characteristic politics. Political conflicts and viewpoints are often an important part of Heinlein's stories. His own politics, uh, which we might call right-wing anarchism or libertarian, mixed with ideas of social Darwinism, come out occasionally, most clearly in the novel The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And the sixth characteristic, sexuality. Unlike other science fiction writers at that time, such as Asimov, he writes about sex frankly. Some of his works depicts uh, polyamory as well as incest. Uh, so he wasn't afraid to address not only sexuality, but uh, taboo sexual topics. Now, there's some significant works I want to talk about before we get to uh, what you read for today's class, All You Zombies. Uh, one is the short story By His Bootstraps from 1941, and this was published under Heinlein's pseudonym Anson MacDonald, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. A pseudonym is a, is a name that an author uses to uh, disguise who's really writing the story. Um, and in Heinlein's case, uh, I believe with this particular story, he was having another story that he had written published in the same issue. So this was a way that he could get two stories into one issue of a magazine uh, without it um, maybe looking a little inappropriate or looking strange to the readers that uh, he would have two stories in the same issue. So By His Bootstraps is another time travel story in which a character pulls himself up by his bootstraps to become a king in the future by enlisting his past self, to do the things necessary to bring about his rise in power. And it raises some of these questions from uh, All You Zombies, uh, which are the paradoxes that, that uh, we, we come, into, they come into play when we're dealing with time travel narratives, like you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, so to speak. A second story is Waldo from 1942. And this is a really important story about a crippled inventor who lives on a space station and uses remote-controlled appendages to do work. And this is where the name for this kind of technology, where you talk about remote manipulators, uh, they're called Waldos, and that's because of this story. The third work that you should know about is called Starship Troopers from 1959. And Starship Troopers is about the training and deployment of Juan Johnny Rico to fight an insect-like alien species known by the derogatory term, the bugs. This story, or this novel, popularized the idea of the space marines, but without actually using that term. Heinlein had, had done that in other stories and adopted the idea from earlier writers, including Bob Olson, who first used the term Space Marines in a 1932 story in Amazing Stories called Captain Brink of the Space Marines and E.E. E. Doc Smith's Lensman series. Starship Troopers won the 1960 Hugo for Best Novel. And I think it's also important to note that with Starship Troopers, um, uh, Johnny Rico is a Puerto Rican, uh, so we're seeing like you know, different kinds of representation in the story. There's also men and women fighting alongside one another. So um, the the Marines aren't like they were at that time, uh, where it was you know men only um, soldiers. A fourth work 
uh, that I want you guys to know about is called Stranger in a Strange Land from 1961. It's about an earth man named Valentine Michael Smith who is raised by Martians on Mars and then returns to Earth. Through uh, Valentine's eyes, we see the horrors of consumer culture and conservatism. Smith, with his psionic or mind powers and innocence, transforms into a messiah figure offering humanity the power of grokking before he discorporates. And this idea of to grok, the term grok, comes from this novel. Um, and to grok means to fully understand something in a uh, almost visceral way. Uh, so it's not just simply like you're reading something and say, okay, I understand how that works. It's to know it so completely that it becomes a part of yourself. Uh, the novel explores politics, religion, and consumerism, and it won the 1962 Hugo for Best Novel. Um, and the next novel to know about is The Moon is a Harsh Mistress from 1966. And it's about a lunar colony's revolt against an exploitative Earth. Uh, and it's all about politics. Uh, it also introduces um, the abbreviation Tons Toffel. T-A-N-S-T-A-A-F-L. Tons Toffel. Anybody guess what that means? Tons Toffel means there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and this novel won the 1967 Hugo. And then in 1973, we have Time Enough for Love. And this is one of several novels and stories featuring the character Lazarus Long, Woodrow Wilson Smith, who was the longest living human being ever. It explores the adventures in Inui of Long from our past and going into our future. This novel won the 1974 Hugo and Locus Awards. And then that brings us to the story that we read for today's class, Heinlein's All You Zombies. Um, this was Heinlein's last short story before he exclusively focused on novels afterwards. It was published in the March 1959 issue of uh, the magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. And the story is about a person who, due to being intersexed and given access to time travel technology, becomes their own father and mother. In fact, all the major characters in the story are this one person at different ages and presenting a different sex pre- and post-sex reassignment surgery. Some terms that we should define to help us think about this story. Uh, sex is the biology of reproduction. Generally, this means male and female. However, many individuals are born intersexed or having an ambiguous sex or a mixture of sexes. Uh, this type of person would be called intersexed. Uh, which is rooted in ambiguity or duality of biological sex organs in a single person. This used to be called hermaphroditism. Essentially, intersexed individuals have both sets of sexual organs in different appearance and stages of development. Connected, or perhaps layered on this biological reality, is transgenderism. To be transgendered is to have a psychological identity where your biological sex or sex expression doesn't match what one believes their gender to be. Now, transgenderism may be rooted in biology and includes intersexed individuals, uh, individuals with endocrinological disorders, uh, and also uh, disorders of hormone production and reception genetic disorders, so, which means that even though your body produces the right kind of hormones for you, uh, your body's genetics have caused certain parts of your biology not to respond to the hormones. Because the hormones you know, signal to our body to do different things. And if you can't respond to that, those hormones, 
then obviously your body is not going to react the way that um, your know, quote-unquote normal body would. Another term related to this is called non-binary, which you may have heard before. Finally, transgenderism is rooted in the cultural construction of sex, which we call gender. These are the attributes, characteristics, and tropes that societies create around the sexes of male and female. For example, blue for boy and pink for girls are expressions of gender. There's nothing about blue and pink that's rooted in our biological sex. Likewise, makeup is for women and not for men. This division has to do with gender, the construction of um, sex expression and culture. While biological sex is largely unchanging, gender changes over time as a culture changes over time. Now, before writing All You Zombies, Heinlein was likely familiar with publicized cases of male to female MTF trans women. These would be uh, you know, transgendered persons that, that transition from uh, a male identity to a female identity. For example, Christine Jorgensen, uh, 1926 to 1989, was the first widely known recipient of sexual reassignment surgery in the United States. Her case and the publicity surrounding it raised awareness of transgenderism a long time ago. There was also Roberta Cowell, uh, born 1918, died in 2011, who was born as Robert Marshall Cowell, a celebrated British fighter pilot during World War II and later a race car driver. Cowell was the first British recipient of sexual reassignment surgery, and notably, she was the friend and patient of Lawrence Michael Dillon, who was born Laura, the first recipient of female-to-male sexual reassignment surgery in Britain. Uh, so your transgender sex reassignment goes both ways, um, not just your male-to-female, but also uh, female-to-male. Now, there's also tragedy surrounding transgenderism that you should be aware of. In addition to the violence leveled against trans and non-binary people, some scientists have used transgender people as experimental subjects without an established body of knowledge corroborating their theories. For example, Dr. John Money, uh, born 1921, died in 2006, a psychologist and sexologist who studied sex and gender identity believed that gender was learned. He sought to prove his theory in the case you see here of David Reimer, who was born in 1965 and died in 2004. After a botched circumcis circumcision, Money used Reimer as a case study in sex reassignment and learning gender. Things did not go well for Reimer, who was reassigned his sex as a girl, and he was raised as a girl. Though, before puberty, she began self-identifying as male. He transitioned to male in his teens, but lived a troubled life, eventually committing suicide at age 38. Today's, today, money's approaches and theories have been largely discredited. I mean, there's obviously much more complex than um, one's gender it is something that we learn. It's, it's complicated both by our biology as well as the culture that we uh, live in. I bring up these issues and mention these, these, these important names uh, because despite Heinlein using them as a way to make a story possible, these people are not simply objects to be appropriated and used for the purposes of storytelling and entertainment. There are some other concepts that I want you to know about in relation to this story. First, there's the Ouroboros, which is a serpent or dragon eating its tail, and that's spelled O-U-R-O-B-O-R-O-S, Ouroboros. 
It represents self-reflexivity, recreating, self-generating, or to borrow another mythical image, the phoenix is akin to the Ouroboros because it rises from its own ashes. Second, there's the concept of solipsism, or the idea that we can only be sure of our own mind, that everything outside of our mind uh, could be a simulation, it could be all made up. Um, so the only thing that we can be sure of is our own mind, our own identity. This seems to be the main character's take on the world. He is only certain of his own mind. Third, the zombie. The contemporary idea of a zombie comes after Heinlein's story in films like George Romero's Night of the Living Dead uh, from 1968. Um, zombie is mentioned in the film's script direction, but not in any spoken dialogue. This kind of zombie is an undead creature that feeds on the flesh, sometimes the brains of the living. If the living is bit by a zombie, they become a zombie themselves. Romero gives Richard Matheson's, M-A-T-H-E-S-O-N, Richard Matheson's 1954 novel, I Am Legend, which was later remade as it was uh, adapted as a film starring Will Smith. Uh, Romero gives Matheson's I Am Legend as the source for his inspiration. Matheson's depiction of vampire-like creatures spreading a contagion and the ensuing apocalypse informs the development of the contemporary zombie. Like Romero's movie, there's no mention of zombie. What might zombie have meant to Heinlein? The concept of a zombie comes to us from Africans brought to the Caribbean and the Americas. They believe that a zombie is a corpse revived by witchcraft that remains under the control of the person who revived it. As a colloquialism, a zombie can be someone who is apathetic, slow-minded, or not that smart. Imagine someone who seems out of it, or not aware of what's going on around him. The main character in the story is sure of his identity and life, but he questions all of us other zombies, essentially asking, how did we come to be? Whereas he knows where he came to be because he's both his own mother and father. Now, in the story, uh, there's the jukebox which I want to make sure everybody knows what a jukebox is, which is essentially a coin-operated record player that were once quite popular you know, in eating and drinking establishments. Now, in the story, the jukebox is playing a song by Lonzo and Oscar titled, I'm My Own Grandpa. Um, this particular song you know, was released in 1947, and it was written by Dwight Latham and Moe Jaffin. And it relates a funny story about marriage and procreation that results in the narrator becoming essentially his own grandpa. Um, go to YouTube and do a search for this song. Um, you can uh, just do a search for I'm, I'm My Own Grandpa, Dwight Latham, L-A-T-H-A-M, and Mo Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E, uh, and you'll be able to listen to that. There's also newer covers of the song as well that you can listen, but I would try to find that 1947 version. Uh, then finally, for all you zombies, I, I included this diagram that I found online some years ago. There's newer versions of this that you can find, I think, on Wikipedia. Uh, but it diagrammatically, you're using a diagram, shows essentially what's taking place in the story. That essentially the character plays all these different parts because of their intersexuality, that they have uh, both sex organs and they change their sex uh, different times in their life so that they're, you know, through time travel, are able to play all these different roles in the story and essentially become uh, their own father and mother. It's, it's a brain teaser, I think, uh, to think about how the story works out. Uh, so you may want to map this out on your own to try to better understand what's taking place in the story. Now, the other reading that we had for today was by this writer, Tom Godwin. Uh, he was born in 1915 and passed away in 1980. You can see him here on the left, pictured with his wife. 
Uh, Tom Godwin was a fine writer in The Campbellian and Astounding Traditions, but he published only about 30 stories in his life. And he had a rough life. Family issues caused him to drop out of school after third grade. He had kyphosis, K-Y-P-H-O-S-I-S. He had kyphosis, or the excessive curvature of the spine leading to hunchback, which shortened his military career. And to deal with his family and health problems, he turned to drink and was an alcoholic later in life. Now, this story that you read for today, The Cold Equations, is a widely anthologized story. And it was originally published in the August 1954 issue of Astounding. And here you can see the cover. The Cold Equations is considered maybe the penultimate or the, the best example of hard science fiction, uh, which again, Alan Steele, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, defined in the New York Review of Science Fiction as hard SF is the form of imaginative literature that uses either established or carefully extrapolated science as its backbone. Okay, so remember that term, hard science fiction. Get that into your notes. And the cold equations is like the best, one of the best examples of what hard science fiction is. Now, we're used to the Disney optimistic view of things in most stories that we enjoy. But this cannot be so in hard science fiction. While there is the possibility of a happy ending, any plot development and ending is completely dependent on natural law and any constraints detailed in the story itself. Now, the idea for the cold equations appears in earlier science fiction stories. You know, as I've talked about before, uh, science fiction, we can say, is very incestuous. You know, it, it, it recycles and reuses a lot of plot ideas. Uh, and those ideas get reinvented and the stories get retold in lots of different ways. So for the cold equation, some of the earlier concepts of this kind of story come to us from E.C. Tubbs, T-U-B-B, um, his story Precedent from May 1952 in the magazine New Worlds. And also comic books, Al Feldstein's A Weighty Decision from 1952 in Weird Science. Now, Godwin tried to give the cold equations a happy ending. But when he would submit the story to John W. Campbell Jr. at Astounding, Campbell insisted that Godwin stay true to physical law and the constraints dictated within the story. They went back and forth on drafts until Campbell accepted the published version. And as you know from reading it, the story concerns a distant planet called Woden with a medical emergency and it's in need of supplies. A cruiser sends out an EDS, an emergency dispatch ship, with only enough fuel to travel to Woden and safely land with its lone pilot and the supplies. Unfortunately, a teenage girl who wants to see her brother on Woden hides aboard the ship. When discovered, the pilot has to follow protocol and eject the girl from the ship due to the additional mass that she adds to the ship. Allowing for the additional mass might lead to the EDS not having enough fuel to safely land on Woden. After letting her talk to her brother via radio, she is ejected from the ship via the airlock. The cold equations are those that govern classical mechanics and the efficiencies and operation of the EDS and its rockets. I would encourage you to read the story uh, you know, again if you, if you have the time and maybe devise your own way of saving the girl. Because in this case, you know, I and many others don't think necessarily the cold equations are so airtight that there couldn't be another solution to the story. But this is one of the fun things about reading a story about this is to imagine like you know, how we might change it or how we might be able to solve the problem differently than the way that the writer has presented it to us. Um, but considering the cold equations of the physical world, the story asks us what can be done to avoid such a tragedy through better design, backup systems, uh, reserves, and maybe even security, right?
So this concludes the uh, second part of the Golden Age of Science Fiction, uh, where we read uh, Robert A. Heinlein and Tom Godwin. And so I'll post a separate video that talks about uh, how to do some of your research for uh, the research essay in the class. Uh, remember, I'm going to have uh, video office hours. I'll post the link um, on our Open Lab site for that. You can email me, and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can uh, in response to any you know, questions you might have or problems that may come up. If you're having trouble keeping up with the class, uh, please let me know, because uh, I can also try to put you in touch with resources that may be able to help you out depending on what the problem is. Uh, but I want everybody to be able to successfully make it through the class, um, I think is, you know, doable, uh, but it's something that we have to work together on, okay? So good luck, stay healthy, be well, take care of those around you, uh, and um, uh, I wish you all the best of luck.